what is it going to take for a company like Dell to truly adopt a Bitcoin standard? Like, Do you have a price prediction? Like a couple of people that have been like 288K in like the next cycle. So I'm like, that's that's a number I agree with and would like to see. The point of the Taproot Asset Protocol is to essentially bring Bitcoin back into the you know, review and say, hey, like we can do this on Bitcoin. We're really going after the business and kind of enterprise adoption of how do we really start getting businesses to use Bitcoin. CBDCs are coming. I'm like, it's basically that already. I was like, they can stop your bank account. They print it whenever they want. It's already digital. We already have basically CBDCs, whether people like to kind of admit it or not. Custodial lightning is really, really, really easy, but that's not true lightning in a sense. If we want Bitcoin to be like a financial asset of the world, like you're going to have a lot of financial products being built on it. It'd be so good that people are like, I don't want that. And they'll just run to the Bitcoin standard. So it's like, I'm opting out of that. Do you expect a major program this, this year? Is, is that something on your, on your mind? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, this whole, this cycle is, you know, going to be unique in my mind. Um, you know, this is my third. Um, so, you know, pre preparing accordingly. And we know we still have a couple more probably months until you really start to see kind of the fireworks. You know, I, I imagine sometime around like the, uh, you know, the U.S. election. But um, yeah, I just think you have so many different things kind of blending together. You know, you've got the, obviously the ETFs, um, you know, you'll have a little bit more of like the minor kind of capitulation and sell off a bit. Um, just, I think more awareness and demand coming through, you know, just more and more people every day, you know, DCA or just buying businesses, people onboarding, you name it. Um, obviously politically now, you know, no, no matter what your kind of leaning is, you know, that's become front and center. Um, crypto broadly has. So, you know, that's going to be another kind of driving factor I see. And then, um, yeah, you know, generally it's like six, seven months after the having that you really start to see some movement. Um, and then yeah, I think the election itself will have a, a little bit of an outcome or influence on the outcome of really how much we move. But uh, yeah, I'm excited for it. Yeah, I think the having is there's some uh, I had someone that did some stuff like I'm totally uninterested in, in price charts or anything like that. But it's always one fun to talk about. One sad. Yeah, one, one sad is one sad. But I mean, the, the price is still important. I feel like when, when you when you have, uh, especially for people that are not deep in Bitcoin and not have done the research like thousands of hours of podcast listenings and stuff like that, yep. um, they really care about the price and they really look forward to like, oh, what, what, what could the price be? And I, I, I mean, my thing is like, they always probably think like, where can Bitcoin go? Like they, they try to yeah. figure out the total addressable of ma uh, market for Bitcoin. And that's why I think like price predictions actually serve a purpose and actually are something positive for Bitcoin. I completely changed my opinion on that. It was like one year ago, it was completely different. And then I was like, oh, no, no, no. I see it. Uh, I put, when I put a price tag in a thumbnail, I know there will be more new people in and there are also more Absolutely. new big questions in there. So th this has some effects uh, actually. And I feel like that's a, an underrated um, marketing tool. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we can be honest, you know, it's like most people are, when they hear Bitcoin, you know, they're just going to think price immediately, you know, the, the mass, the masses. Um, and, you know, it is important, you know, like to be frank, like the world still runs on fiat, the dollar, and that's what people price things in. Um, you know, I think eventually we'll obviously, you know, hopefully transition to the Bitcoin, you know, standard, if you will. But uh, yeah, that's what people care about, especially when, you know, at least in my time, you know, my lifetime, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, I would say to date, like they just haven't really had like a way to save or like really get ahead, um, you know, like with rates at zero for so long, you know, like when you had a checking or a savings account, like you weren't earning that much, you know, not, not when the, like, the last generations were doing. Um, so the, really the only way you could you know, really get ahead was kind of put money in some stocks. And that's if you had enough, you know, to really see some of the gains and the appreciation, but, um, or something like, you know, Bitcoin. So it's like, if you're putting your money in Bitcoin and you've seen the past, you know, gains and, you know, the way it does its you know, typical cycles, um, yeah, you're going to probably care about the price if dollars at the end of the day is kind of what you're spending. Um, and we see that, you know, even globally still, you know, even with Bitcoin being used, uh, you know, and as a kind of, you know, not just one a store of value, but also like the unit of um, account for when people, uh, you know, use the Lightning Network, you know, and then kind of, uh, you know, swap out to like their local currency. It shows that like, yes, they have value for Bitcoin, the network and transferring value over it, but they still want to use, you know, dollar denominated assets or some type of, you know, fiat currency. So I think people will care about it still for quite some time, especially if they're looking for the gains. 
Absolutely. And it's interesting because when we had the internet revolution or like the internet uh, coming up in like the 1990s, early 2000s, um, there was no token under, underlying everything. Like there was, of course, a Facebook stock, there was an uh, Apple stock and all this stuff that they really benefit from it. And it's kind of the internet token, but Bitcoin has the network where you can use it, but it also has the token. And yep. that's why like how, how crazy would it be if the internet had a token and you could see like in real life, right. the, the, the signal, what, what the internet is going. So like, that's kind of Bitcoin. Like you can invest in the whole internet and that's, that's the, th that comparison usually makes it uh, interesting for, for people that come from the internet world, understand that the network effects, uh, and, yep. uh, they don't really get like what Bitcoin is. And they're like, oh no, it's not, it's not Facebook stock. It's like buying a, a part of of the internet protocol like that's mm -hmm. that's basically how i dis describe uh bitcoin always and when you look at now at uh that cycle and uh, i wanted to start off with a different question but <laughs> kind of developing that like um do you have a uh, price prediction do you have some some goal in mind what what the current bull run is obviously predictions are um always wrong and some are useful <laughs> but but it's like do, do you have some model or framework how you think about that um, I mean, I honestly always just, you know, the price is obviously so unpredictable um, to a degree. Uh, you just, I've seen so many people be like, oh, you know, I got in at the top or, you know, they never want to get, you know, we see the memes all the time. Like they never want to buy, you know, when it's down at 55, but they want to, uh, you know, not, or, you know, then why didn't I buy when it's back up to 72, you know, thousand or whatever it is. Um, so I think, yeah, for price predictions, I mean, I always love the 288K number. I think, um, Willie Wu puts it out or somebody. There's like a couple of people that have been like 288K and like the next cycle. So I'm like, that's that's a number I agree with and would like to see. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I would say at least over, you know, 100K um, is, you know, at least my baseline predictions. Um, but yeah, I think it could go, you know, much, much higher. Um, and I think just even whether you like it or not, uh, you know, some of the stuff that's being built on Bitcoin with all these, you know, ordinals and BRC20 runes, tapered assets, all these different things. Um, just as there's more and more demand for Bitcoin, the asset, um, yeah, you're just going to see increase, you know, I think price action over time, um, given it's permissionless and people are going to use it however they want. That's perfect. Uh, and then this is, uh, gives, uh, gives us a perfect uh, uh, guide now in the next to topic about tapered assets and all that things. Um, for people don't know, they don't know what taproot assets, runes, and and all the things that you just mentioned are. Like, what what is that, and 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 why do we we need those things? Yeah, so I mean, there's obviously like a you know a lot of different protocols and you know meta you know protocols that have been coming out in the last you know year or two. Um, I think ordinals is probably the you know first one that people probably really really heard of um, but there's some obviously older historical ones like people have been doing this you know since bitcoin's inception um but yeah tapered assets specifically which is what our my company jolts focuses on um is a protocol that was you know uh developed by lightning labs i think they announced it maybe a little over two years ago um but yeah in large part they raised about 70 million dollars um in large part to, to build that protocol out um and it's really meant to make you know Bitcoin and, you know, mostly the Lightning Network is where the value is for this protocol, but it's meant to make it like a multi-asset network. Um, you know, and what, what does that mean? I think the biggest use case that people point to for taproot assets is, you know, stable coins um, on Lightning. That's stable coins, whether, you know, it's actually, it's actually a really crazy data point, and, um, uh, kind of something that we've seen over the last couple of years, but like it is like the use case on all blockchains. Like it is the unit of account settlement, like it just has taken over not ethereum it's not like the native tokens anymore it's just stable coins um which is again really interesting seeing that demand but the point of tapered the tapered asset protocol is to essentially bring bitcoin back into the you know purview and say hey like we can do this on bitcoin you know it originally started there um back with like omni omni layer i think um i don't know how many years ago that was but uh that's really the goal with you know tapered asset protocol is how can we do this on bitcoin but do it at scale and do it in a way to where it's not you know, basically filling up, you know, the mempool or blocks with a bunch of data uh, where you can do this in a way where the the required data, there is some, obviously some on-chain footprint, but it's you know, drastically less than what Ordinals, BRC20, Runes, and all these other things are doing. Um, and it's just more efficient. Um, and I think the really, really cool thing is that Tapered Assets, while it, you know, started, uh, or the first major release 
was the on-chain component, which I think was like October or November of last year. Um, but now we've got the uh, upcoming, which should be in the next week or so, is the actual first major release of Taproot Asset Channels, which will allow Taproot Assets to actually, you know, again, go go across and you know, be custody, swap, traverse, transfer, pay, you know, X, Y, Z, but basically flow over uh, the Lightning Network. Um, now, really, it, it, in, in my mind, for the Lightning Network itself and Taproot Assets, uh, you know, fungibles are really the only thing that can go across, you know, like the tokens, if you will. Um, you can't really do like collectibles over over um, over Lightning, but you still do have the on-chain component of Taproot Assets that works uh, both on-chain and, and uh, on Lightning. And there's a, yeah, just a lot of really cool stuff, too, just at the protocol level. Um, that it enables not just, uh, you know, if you kind of put aside the assets that can be created, there is just some actual um, technical benefits to helping scaling Lightning and um, just common day transactions too. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of really cool stuff coming out and we're actually supporting several businesses and partners right now that want to build um, and, you know, we're building for on the Tappered Asset uh, Protocol. Do you think that at some point everything uh can or will be built on top of bitcoin i don't know if it'll be everything but i think you'll see like a vast again whether people like it or not it's like all the stuff with ordinals and maroons and brc20 i mean you saw a lot of developers and obviously a ton of capital you know uh, like investment but also just people spending their money or spending their bitcoin um just flow onto bitcoin because you could finally do this on bitcoin so like the build on bitcoin kind of thesis and um you know, it's just, it's just proving to play out that people want to do this on the most, you know, decentralized uh, network, but it's one that, you know, is seen as, you know, pristine or secure. Um, it's just kind of this granite foundation versus the others, you know, that we all know, and, you know, we probably rinse and repeat and say it, but, you know, they're just different protocols, different rules, um, not, not decentralized. People can kind of change them, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, but I think, um, I think the really cool one will be definitely, you know, stable coins on lightning, That's where we're kind of, you know, placing our bet and most of our focus with our with our SDK and swapping service, just because there's there's going to be needed uh, tooling um, and infrastructure basically for kind of two phases. I see it as like you'll need the tooling and the infrastructure for, you know, any type of stable coin or payments you know system to really ride on Lightning um, and to bring that liquidity in um, and really start expanding the network, um, which you know should happen innately um, as more. You know, stable coin, stable coin providers come on to the Lightning Network. Um, and the way Lightning Labs did it, I think, was it was pretty clever. Um, but then for, I think, like, if you want Bitcoin, Lightning is like these kind of bottom layers. And then, you know, you have whatever the fiat-backed stable coin or whatever that, you know, asset is um, that still rides on Lightning, uses Bitcoin as the, you know, underlying um, kind of, you know, asset or unit of account still under the hood um, for enterprises or just like, really, really broad scale adoption, you know, I'm thinking like big businesses, you know, like Michael Dell, you know, is tweeting about Bitcoin, you know, lately, it's like, what is it going to take for, you know, a company like Dell to truly adopt a Bitcoin standard? Like even MicroStrategy today is like, great what they've done. They're you know buying it and holding it, but like, what is it going to take to move or kind of take that next step of getting like real mainstream adoption of using the Bitcoin network And again, Bitcoin, the asset is the kind of uh, really like getting mainstream adoption of people using it day to day. Because I just think some people are still too hesitant to take the full leap of, you know, just using Bitcoin in their day to day. And we've seen that. Like, and that's why, like, people aren't even using other tokens as their day to day. They're using stable coins. But, you know, they appreciate the network. They appreciate the, you know, being able to do things, you know, on, on Ethereum and Tron and all these other things. But they're still using stable coins. So I think that's what you kind of need for the real next big run up and, For mainstream adoption um yeah globally for you know enterprise day-to-day -day business dealings settlement things like that it's interesting for me when when we look at all the different use cases i mean like the biggest uh benefit you personally i feel like you have with bitcoin when you just like buy it hold it don't touch it like that that that's kind of like the way where you have the least uh, risk of like losing it, where you have just uh, yep. like the, the further away it's from you of the sell button, the further away it's from you from just using it, transacting <laughs> it. It's, it's it, it was historically the, the best. And it's also for me like interesting because I have a, a pretty sophisticated setup where it's not even that easy for me uh, to spend it. Like I have to drive to different locations and stuff like that. So like it's, 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 it's pretty while the, the security measurements the, that I took for for my personal setup but 
um, the interesting part here is like, it's, it's not done with a click of a button. Like, like I have to really move and in the physical world and do something to move my Bitcoin, my, my main stack, of course. Yeah. But outside of that, like when it's in the lightning wallet or something like that, it's like on a really easy to handle, like something like a wallet of Satoshi or something like you just like click a button, tick, 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 it's there. Um, it's, it's way more like it, it goes away <laughs> quicker. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting how people now use it, I guess, as the store of value as a safe haven. And I'm interested in, interested in like how, how this will go and like bit, people actually using their Bitcoin for other things and the transactions also when they, they get a little bit more uh, expensive right now, they're on, a, on a, a lower end, but if they get more expensive again, um, if they are doing all this, those things on top of Bitcoin, yep. That's why Lightning, I feel like, is, is important. How do you see that uh, in general, like Bitcoin scaling with Lightning, with like Fediment, with all the all those different uh, protocols that are going on? Yeah, um, I mean, I think like you know, eCash, Fediment, all these other things are you know all interesting. I think there's going to be a lot of different plays on what an L2 or and how to scale or just leverage Lightning. You know, I've I think I've heard it more recently. You know, just like Lightning is still going to be kind of this interconnective tissue for all these different kind of ways of leveraging lightning and bitcoin you know whether it's um you know some type of side chain whether it's you know e-cash whether it's tapered assets on lightning you know you name it um but i do think you know tapered assets does again have some of these benefits that you know help for those types of uh, you know higher uh, on-chain fee pressure you know they've got uh, a couple concepts where it's like you have via utxos um again tapered asset the actual like transactions just have much less footprint than typical transaction other benefits like privacy things like that um but from our like from our wallet sdk and our swapping service like that is kind of what our end goal and mission is is to make you know we've, we've already got like you said your kind of cold storage your savings account like you have your you know little nest that you're never going to touch you're just going to keep stacking keep it over there but for your kind of day-to-day life um or just you know whatever that amount of money you need to you know again, transact or just do things with every day from day to day. Um, that's where we see lightning and especially tapered assets kind of shining. Cause again, you like in our UX, for example, like we see, like you probably won't store your, I mean, maybe you, like we're building towards that, but you probably wouldn't store like your, you know, big savings account on there. It's more for like your day to day, um, day to day spending. So you'll have, you know, a Bitcoin balance, um, you know, a amount, uh, that is stored in, you know, just Bitcoin, or, and then you'll have your kind of like what we imagine is like your local uh, fiat amount, which is like a, you know, USD, UST, USDT, you know, stable coin or some local stable coin that you have that you can spend, you know, at merchants, um, peer to peer, whatever it may be. Um, and you can just quickly and easily and swap in between those when, whenever you need to. So, you know, whatever, you know, maybe you just got paid, um, you know, 50% goes to your savings. The other 50 is meant for day to day. You can still keep, you know, of that 50, 50%, maybe it's 30% still kept in Bitcoin and your, you know, Jolt's wallet or you know, SDK powering another wallet. Um, and then the other 20% is, you know, the local, you know, stable coin or um, fiat currency. And then you can use that to, you know, easily spend it without having to worry about the price fluctuations, you know, of Bitcoin compared to, you know, your local currency. Um, and also vice versa, like we're, like we're really going after the, the, you know, I'll say business and kind of enterprise adoption of how do we really start getting businesses to use Bitcoin to like, you know, not just either keep it on their balance sheet or, you know, use it as a, you know, some type of treasury asset, but like, how do we really get them to start moving the needle of pushing Bitcoin through, you know, day to day, whether it's business to businesses, um, you know, financial transactions or whether it's their end consumer customer um, transactions as well. But uh, yeah, like even in our, in our wallet SDK um, for lightning, like we're trying to make the UX so simple um, you know, we don't even have, uh, what we would, we're kind of doing a hybrid system, I'll say, um, where you don't even have to do channel management. Um, so we're just kind of doing these trustless swaps at the end, uh, to where if, you know, if you need your certain amount of sats, or if you need a certain amount of, um, whatever the stable coin or token is, um, that you will basically just handle that, uh, trustlessly between our node or any other node that would be running kind of the, the swapping service. Um, so basically you don't have to deal with, you know, any type of channel management because kind of to your point, it was like lightning custodial lightning is really, really, really easy, but that's not, I don't say like true lightning in a sense. Um, so we think we've come up with a pretty novel approach, um, to basically provide the custodial type UX, 
um, but not have it be custodial, fully non-custodial, trustless, and being able to enjoy the benefits of, you know, the Lightning Network um, and the speed and low cost of it. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure they are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And for those of you who are in search of a new Bitcoin exchange where they can buy their Bitcoin from, I recommend my personal Bitcoin exchange 21 Bitcoin. With code Robin, you get a hefty discount for all your purchases in the future. There's a, there's always like one question coming up in my mind when we talk about uh, Bitcoin outside of the real, um, like when we talk about Taproot S and other things, like there's like this main use case of Bitcoin right now to store of value. Then there's like, maybe it gets to the medium exchange. Then we have like the ordinals, the NFTs, the Taproot assets, all the, all the things on top of Bitcoin. Um, I... I'm always a believer that like no, no matter what you do in Bitcoin, it, it is good for Bitcoin. Um, so I don't see it as a threat. I don't see it. I don't even see it as a distraction uh, because I think the the people that are coming in uh, for like NFT, NFTs on, on top of Bitcoin, they probably would not be in Bitcoin anyways. If there would not be <laughs> any right. NFTs in Bitcoin, they, they would be on Ethereum or something like that. So it's actually a good thing um, uh, to have them in, in our ecosystem. Um, but do you see any any threats or any any distractions when, when we talk about uh, those things? or is it like all, all good for, for Bitcoin or could there be some 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 threat that you can, could think about? Um, I don't know if I consider it like a threat. I mean, obviously I think there'll be, you know, rug pulls or projects that still scam people or, you know, again, like people do this already day to day. You know, it's like people go to Vegas and just gamble money. People gamble money on, you know, sports betting, you know, FanDuel and all that stuff. Like people are willing to take their money and, spend it on things that they think will either appreciate in price or just again just what are the odds that i you know win um and come out higher than i whatever i put in um and i think you know that people do have real demand for things of like collectibles and art and i mean there is some interesting i think there's some interesting things out there um whether you agree with like ordinals or not i mean i think it is like pretty interesting that you can you know store something on the bitcoin blockchain which we all know and perceive is like going to be like the most permanent secure you know storage layer you know if they if not that like i think that's its purpose um but it is like an interesting capability now um you may be been able to do it for a while but it's like that is just uh you know making that easier is is, is really interesting um again use cases right now seem to be a little more speculative but um yeah i could definitely see where something like that is valuable one day or it comes in a form factor that's maybe not so uh you know damaging maybe to like the on on chain footprint um but yeah i think experimenting and building is is always good it's it's always interesting i mean i still think taproot assets and, and the taproot asset protocol is like the best way to do these types of things um i mean we're seeing like we support a lot of different use cases um like we're we have a couple partners that we're working with that are doing things for like loyalty and rewards and incentives um and this is actually kind of the reason we started going down this journey on taproot assets because we started as a, re a rewards and incentives company and kind of once we got out of like the Bitcoin space, like a lot of our early partners and customers you know, were Bitcoin companies. Um, but once we started talking to more like traditional companies, you know, your Web2 or just, you know, your, the Nikes, the Nordstrom, Starbucks of the world, if you will, um, you know, it was just like too, a little too much of a leap to start doing like Bitcoin rewards 
Um, and so we were like, how can we make Bitcoin, you know, it's obviously still attractive, but how can we make it a little more, um, you know, just common and something that people are used to uh, in like their typical points or loyalty system? And, and we were like, well, can we do something like Bitcoin back points um, where it's like, you know, to the end user or customer member, whatever it is, it looks like a common point that they're earning. You know, most people are part of some rewards program, um, but, you know, these points are, uh, you know, rewards that you get actually increase in value, you know, over time as Bitcoin goes up. Um, and it's just something that, again, is a little more digestible and, you know, something that's not as far as a reach. Um, and so that's kind of why we started going down this journey. And, you know, that's a use case that, you know, I don't think is harmful to Bitcoin. It's another use case that has real world um, implications, but it's also something that obviously people find valuable. You know, the global loyalty market is massive. Um, and so I think like there's just like a lot of different interesting use cases that can be uh, built on Bitcoin. It's just, you know, will it always be done right the first time? No. Um, but, you know, there's going to be always iterations and people trying to build things better. So you know, I think in time things will work out and we'll have a lot of interesting things. And that's, yeah, I mean, if we want Bitcoin to be like the financial asset of the world, like you're going to have a lot of financial products being built on it. So that tooling and those services, products, platforms, you name it, like they're going to be built um, one way or another. And yeah, they're not, I don't think we're ever going to get it right the first time and there's always trade-offs, but um, yeah, I'm always excited to see what's being built as long as it's, you know, with good intentions and hopefully has the best tech stack and, you know, way of delivering it. Uh, I, I, I love that a lot because you, you know, like the, we, we need to build this, this common financial fiat system kind of in, in, in Bitcoin. Uh, it, it's still a question to me, like if, if, if we actually get rid of the fiat system, the longer I mean, like the first I came into Bitcoin, there was no question in my mind that fiat is will ever go away. Uh, I thought like it will always be there. Then I got into Bitcoin, got more and more and was like, oh yeah, of course fiat will go away. And then I'm like, oh, but the, the network effects and, and the power of fiat is really big, like from, from the governments and, and from the thing. Uh, it's it's like I'm I'm right now like writing articles on that on researching on that and and I'm, I'm thinking really hard about like will this actually happen this 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 Bitcoin standard revolution with like there's medium of exchange and unit of account in the Bitcoin world and there is no more fiat or like there's less and less fiat like more and more counters are actually just on a Bitcoin standard um, do do you think that that this will happen on, uh, and this can happen in, for example, my lifetime. I'm like 25. Let's assume I live another 70 years. I mean, our lifetime, I think it could be interesting. I mean, given kind of where a lot of the you know global currencies are at right now in their lifetime, you know, so most of them are what a couple hundred years old now. And if we take what history's done in the past, and typically, you know, at least rhymes, maybe not repeats, but I think we'll see. Yeah, probably some of them go, or at least. Uh, what we all know is hopefully not transform into the the worst version of you know us uh, you know um, usd uh not usdt but you know just any type of basically cbdc um and hopefully we don't see those types of things implemented i'm sure we will um so i think they'll probably end up taking like that path first for the fiat currencies you know we have like our stable coins that we're seeing which i again like i kind of like I know a lot of people don't like them, but I'm like, at least it's kind of a free market version of what maybe the dollar and banking system should have been. Sure, it's like a centralized entity, um, some of them that have created it. But again, there's different types of stable coins. Obviously, fiat backed ones are kind of the or pegged ones are the, 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 the main ones. But I'm like, you know, at least it's not like the Federal Reserve. You know, it's like a private entity that should be doing hopefully something right. And, you know, the, if, you know, market you know, uh, can actually punish bad actors or bad decisions, then that's what we had hoped for. It's not the government just dictating one thing um, with no repercussions. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, we'll, we'll see probably a transition in our lifetime, I would, I would assume so. Um, I still think we've got a ways, you know, a ways to go. Like people that think it's going to happen in the next five, 10 years, I just think that's a little uh, naive. Like it's, the dollar's taking a lot longer. We've been saying it's going to die for a while. Um, and I still think there's like some tricks they have up their sleeve to kind of, you know, push it, uh, push it along a little way. But um, yeah, I just think, you know, I think stable coins are probably that like kind of natural progression. Um, and then just some other form of like, again, maybe it's not a fiat pegged stable coin. There's other types you can do, you know, basket or something that, you know, is, uh, has the underlying value of the asset is pegged to. But I think, um, 
yeah, we'll see a lot of interesting things, at least over the next five to 10 years that can grow into something that might be used and um, yeah, replace, you know, some of these currencies. The, the, the hope that I always have is like those pictures from 1920 or something like that, where uh, there's one picture in, I think it was in New York, uh, taking there's like a picture with like one car and a bunch of horses. And like 10 years later, there's a bunch of cars with like a few horses on the street. Uh, and, and I just hope that we hit this trigger point, this inflection point where like, it's so obvious that we move to a Bitcoin standard. Um, but I don't know if it's hopeful wishing <laughs> or, or if it actually could re go, go real in the end and how quick this will go because adapting, uh, mobility, different mobility thing is definitely a difference to adapting a new monetary standard, even though I'm on a kind of a Bitcoin standard of like hundred percent in Bitcoin. I still use fiat every day, oh, yeah. but because I have to, and because it's volatile, like the volatility is still like uh, bad for the use case of a medium of exchange. If you have your uh, net worth and your savings fluctuating a lot, mm -hmm. um, you're kind of inclined to, especially if you're on the, on the, on the edge, like if you, you don't have like, yeah. if, you, if you have like, uh, you know, so five, much like marginal income or you know you, you can't you yeah know, you can only risk but so much yeah yeah if like if you have 10 million in, in bitcoin and you live on a bitcoin standard you, you don't really care if your stack tomorrow is like 5 million only or like 15 million yeah. uh then it makes total sense but if for the f families that like have like a thousand euros in bitcoin and then they are um, um, then the income is fluctuating, like, oh, sometimes it's like 500 euros and they need 800 or sometimes it's like a thousand euros, but they need 800. So like, ah, that, that, that becomes all of a sudden an issue. <laughs> you kind of put food on the table if the volatility from Bitcoin to ma uh, market goods is of, all of a sudden, uh, off. So that's, that, that's something that also has to decay uh, in the volatility. So. Yeah, but now maybe 20 years, like maybe 20, 20 years, we, we see a lot more, probably not in the next five to 10 years, but 20 years is a long time and there kind of a lot of things happening. Mm -hmm. um, but now to the question uh, that we kind of already answered in, in some regards, but what, what exactly is, is Charles doing and what are you doing uh, uh, there and, and what's the vision there? Yeah, so um, Joel Tazza right now, our main focus um, and what we're building on is, again, kind of re getting ready for what we believe will be, you know, a massive wave um, for when stable coins come to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Um, so we're really focused on the Taproot Asset Protocol and building um, a really, really robust uh, and enterprise kind of grade level um, uh, wallet SDK and swapping service um, to just to your point to basically provide that UX that we've kind of talked about for so long um, that you can get on Lightning without any of the kind of trade offs. Um, and I think, yeah, it's just critical for one everyday consumers, but also like, you know, in enterprises and businesses to be able to have that just very seamless UX. Like you said, it's like, I can't, I literally just can't take, you know, any type of price fluctuation, you know, beyond, you know, 5% or, you know, even just like one or 2%, um, you know, from day to day. So it's like, can I just have this very simple, uh, UX where I have, you know, my stable coin account that has this amount in it. It's sitting in Bic, you know, sitting um, in the wallet, you know, still under the hood, denominated in Sats Bitcoin, and I can easily swap between the two whenever I need to. Um, and I can send, receive, you know, any of that. You know, if there's no restrictions, I'm not going to hit any UX issues or hopefully, you know, any type of Lightning um, routing issues, things of that nature. Having to worry about channel liquidity and management and all that stuff, just like the most simple UX for mass adoption um, that both businesses and consumers can you use. Um, and luckily, again, Taproot Assets uh, supports a lot of really interesting use cases. Um, again, we've done just kind of this payments and generally online, Web3, you know, you name it, doing things like that. Um, but you've also got the loyalty and incentives uh, component that I kind of spoke to. Um, that's still the bulk of our uh, business today, just because we had focused on it for so long. But um, we've got things where, like people are trying to do tokenization on Lightning, where you're bringing like real world assets and tokenizing them on Bitcoin and transferring the value of them or transferring the ownership of, the, of them um, over the Lightning Network and, and Bitcoin. So there's some really interesting stuff there. Um, we're having some early conversations with some pretty big entities and partners on that. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, our goal then probably for the next six months, I would say, and, and real, real focus is just making sure that 
yeah, our SDK and swapping service and just overall tooling um, is really there for like, you know, when the tethers of the world, uh, um, we're talking with several, you know, kind of local geographical um, stable coin providers as well. They want this experience because even some of the other stuff with the other L2s and side chains is still um, a bit of a clunky process. And it's obviously using something that is not technically Bitcoin, it's another chain. Um, so if you can do this all natively uh, on Lightning, that's obviously a killer UX, much simpler, um, and just you know hopefully I'll help, you know allows them to grow and get more adoption, which is what we want to see. Um, and then I think, uh, but yeah, over the next six months, we're just going to see how the release of Taproot Asset Channels goes when the kind of the first big stablecoin you know provider comes and does things on on Lightning, you know Tether or USDC are probably the you know the, the they are the big two. Um, and then, yeah, waiting and seeing how many other businesses and partnerships that we can help um, just ease the transition onto a Bitcoin standard, whether it's, you know, an existing Bitcoin wallet, payment service, your traditional payment service or company, you know, whoever it is, um, the SDK is really meant to be built for, uh, yeah, to, to serve all. Interesting. I love it a lot. Uh, and, and like this this building on Bitcoin thing, um, I'm... I'm kind of like, I'm just like really bullish on, on Bitcoin as the monetary aspect, uh, but the building on Bitcoin and even like stable coins could be interesting in bridging the gap between the fiat uh, world towards the Bitcoin standard. Uh, I'm still not 100% sure how, how we will transition and the transition will be clunky and will be interesting, but it, it, it like it could lead like this this bridge between the, the fiat world to the Bitcoin world. It, uh, it's, it's, it's so interesting to talk about these things and, and see how it goes. And uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to have the podcast because then I actually can go ahead and in, in 10 years, go back and see like, oh, how, how did we imagine that? And oh, how, how wrong we actually were, I uh, think uh, turned out there. Yeah. I do think they will be, I think they provide like the, in my mind, they do provide like the cleanest transition, um, you know, cause it's like, um, you know, we see we want a Bitcoin standard, obviously, um, but to get there, I just still think it's going to take some time. But it's just it's very, very clear from the demand on, like we said, on all the other blockchains, like people want stable coins and the vast majority of them are USD denominated. Um, still the whole real world, you know, running on the dollar, mostly in fiat currencies, um, even some of the lightning companies today, you know, they they are kind of built on that. It's like, yeah, you use the network to transfer value, you know. With sats over the you know the network but then you swap and move move out to your local currency at the you know at the edge um so it's just again data points that people want fiat still um for you know a lot of their day-to-day -day lives and i think if if we bring all this liquidity the of, of stable coins which is you know massive i mean it's already you know overtaking visa and things of that nature and just a short amount of time so it gets that that's wild it's like that that is a massive opportunity a massive market demand you know it's like if this we bring any amount of this liquidity to Bitcoin um, and this actually starts to pick up and be used day to day as people build on Bitcoin and see Bitcoin as the underlying, you know, granite foundation to build on and transact on. You know, I think if we believe that the underlying asset, you know, Bitcoin is right and going to win at the end of the day, um, you know, it's just going to make that transition much easier if you're already kind of natively on Bitcoin and Lightning Rails. Sure, you might be using a stable coin for your day to day lives, but Again, you can easily swap that out, you know, if you want the Bitcoin um, and then, you know, hopefully just makes that transition much easier than likely having some type of restrictions put in place by your bank or your you know, traditional banking or government or whatever it might be. You know, if you're on the traditional banking rails, you know, if you're at least on the Bitcoin and lightning tech stack, then, you know, I think that transition will be much easier and you, you don't have to ask, uh, have, you know, need any permission to do any of that. So I think that's the at least the good stepping stone in my mind. Another interesting thought that came into my mind is right now is like when we have now the most stable coins, obviously in USD because USD is like the, the mother of all uh, fiat currencies and it gets so easy now for everyone in the world to just use those stable coins because they're, they're not really restricted to any borders you can use a stable coin just in cyberspace. Um, will that lead to... Uh, f even faster dying of other fiat currencies as like the Turkish lira and uh, like if if you imagine like someone living in Turkey 
uh, the best thing they can do is like for long term savings, just put it in Bitcoin, and then for like the short term uh, uh, fiat needs, they, they store it in 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 five percent in in, in like USD uh, C or like in in some stablecoin of USD, uh, and then like just at the moment of pay. Um, convert it quickly to Turkish lira, so like that's the like that would be a way better setup for them instead of actually using Turkish lira. Yeah, no, I think you'll like again. Don't get me wrong; like I think fiat currencies will still have their either slow decay and then some. You know, sometimes it's gradually, then suddenly, as we've seen with some of them, it's like oh, you know, overnight they're gone. Um, but regardless, like human behavior is showing us that like they're still in demand; they're going to be used, um, and business behavior. Um, but yeah, I do think it'll, um, and you've even seen to some degree, you know, I think it was the EU that just put something out not too long ago where, you know, they put some restrictions on some of the stable coins. So some governments geographies are a little more restrictive, some are a little more favorable, but, um, you know, I think that they kind of saw the writing on the wall and I think maybe even explicitly said it there, like, you know, we're, we're putting these restrictions in place so they, you know, have a harder time of replacing our fiat currency. But then you, again, you'll have the other countries that are open um, and more like I would say like things in like LATAM that are really starting to pick up with, you know, Bitcoin adoption um, and lightning adoption even more particularly. But stable coins is becoming a big thing there. I think you're seeing it in Southeast Asia, Africa. So like you're going to have, again, a kind of a open market, free market of, you know, countries that make their own decisions and whatever their policies and legal structure they put in place. Um, but again, there's also like, I think you, I think you will see, like, again, we're talking with some of them as well, um, but we are starting to see some really interesting projects that are just not fiat backed, you know, stable coins. Um, like I, I, I know they're like the, the bulk of things right now, but I mean, there's some that are just like coming up that are pretty, pretty cool, you know, over collateralized. Um, you've got some that just have some really interesting tech and way of doing this. They're backed by other assets that are not as, you know, exposed to this type of, you know, manipulation or, you know, overall devaluing. Um, some that are backed by gold, commodities, other things that people find value in the real world, whether you you know you like them or not. But um, I do think there'll be some some interesting things that come out um, over the next few years that just makes like stable coin as an asset class overall on Bitcoin just super super attractive, um, and will definitely benefit the Lightning Network and its growth um, and adoption. I think because yeah, I just think you have to have it if we really want real world adoption from like businesses and merchants. We've kind of got the consumer side and people like hooked on like, oh, it's just store value or it's going to go up in price. But if we really want Bitcoin to become this media of exchange day to day um, without having to have concerns for the price, you know, movement um, compared to any fiat value, it's just going to have to have something that's looks natively just kind of like our rewards concept. It's like it's got to look and act and feel just like I'm using fiat as I was, you know, on traditional banking rails, uh, I think, for businesses to really start accepting it, using it either between businesses, vendors, partnerships, and also their end customers and users. Oh, really nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like this, this bridging idea. Uh, I, I love it. I never thought about stable coins and even like CBDCs maybe being the bridge to the Bitcoin standard. Uh, interesting. Um, I have to think Hopefully about no that. Hopefully CBDCs. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I feel like they, they will come anyways. Like... Uh, I mean, like well, maybe it'll be so good that people are like, I don't want that, and they'll just run to the Bitcoin standard. So it's like I'm opting out of that. Yeah, it's 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 like when you see it of a practical standpoint, it's like, oh, I still have the bad monetary policy, but now the government uh, puts uh, uh, spending limits on it, and you, they can trace me even better, and it's programmable uh, in in a sense. So it's like. I mean, they can effectively do that now anyway. I'm always like, people are like, CBDCs are coming. I'm like, it's basically that already. I was like, they can stop your bank account. They print it whenever they want. It's already digital. Like, it's, we already have basically CBDCs, whether people like to kind of admit it or not. <laughs> yeah, th that's what I'm thinking. Like, I feel like they, they will come. And I don't know what, what the difference ra actually is right now. It's like... Yes, they they will have maybe even more control, and uh, the, the the main thing is probably like cutting out the the commercial banks, maybe that the Federal Reserve directly has a wallet with yeah. um, That's probably uh, the, the, the the end consumer, and like cutting out a little bit of decentralization. Like at least we have a banking system okay. around that that was like it just centralizes it even more and makes the bad things worse and the good things completely disappear. <laughs> Yeah, it literally is just the Fed, the Fed now. So <laughs> it's, it's, uh, 
that, that that's very true yeah it, it, it's an interesting uh concept but yeah uh you i, I think cbdc's will will come in in some regard uh and uh they will hopefully as we saw in nigeria completely fail and then people will not adopt it i know i will not adopt it uh right. uh if 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 not some policeman comes and, and force me to it but uh, i hope it does not come to that in austria but yeah uh before we come to the end routine of the podcast i have one question that i ask every one of my guests um what can we learn from you besides bitcoin yeah um sorry me or joel specifically I, I yeah you you usually i go on the person like if if, yeah, if there's same, something yeah. that's also yeah, from yeah. Joel, like interesting but uh if if uh usually i go on the person i can give some really mean tennis lessons um i played tennis for quite a while um so i, I thought i was going to go professional i played played in college and then learned i was like all right i'm not going to go professional so i can always give some cool tennis lessons but um no i'm pretty well educated and um I mean, again, I love I love technology. Um, my past life, I'm, I was a systems engineer and cloud architect. So I and I've worked in the more traditional IT world. Um, love that. Um, big, big uh, tennis fan. Like I said, Roger Federer fan. So I can give you a lot of information about tennis facts and stuff like that. Um, huge Formula One fan. Um, I do racing simulator racing and um, yeah, follow Formula One really, really close. I say they just had the race up near you the uh, the other week. But yeah, say so there's a lot of things I think you can learn and. I mean, working in a startup day to day, um, you end up wearing quite a different lot of hats and doing a lot of different things. So um, I've learned a lot of different things I never thought I would in my life. Um, you know, where and I've worked on certain startups before uh, Jolts as well. So um, yeah, I've learned a lot of things from business development, sales, technology, legal. Um, you know, you kind of name it, marketing. Um, there's just a slew of things that you kind of have to brute force and learn and almost try to become an expert in when you're. Uh, you know, you head up a startup. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating to see, uh, all, all those uh, developments. And when, when you are, when you start something, uh, you learn a lot. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, our end routine is, uh, pretty simple. The previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, so you get a question from the previous guest and your question from the previous guest is, do you think Satoshi's goal was to fix the money or uh, was there some other goal uh, and if yes what was the goal i personally think i don't know if it was to fix the money i think it was more of a i think it was more of a way to like just i don't want to i'm not going to curse but there's the uh, you know uneffable money book um, i don't know if you've ever read that one but i feel it was more of a way to just say like i am opting out like i don't necessarily need to fix like the us dollar or you know fiat currency it's just a way to say like no government i'm opting out i'm i can do things on my own and i can basically be you know self sufficient um and not have to you know depend on you know the currency that you're providing me um because i still think like bitcoin does have its you know potential risks you know like it's, nothing's perfect um so i do think like it's the best thing that's been created to date um, but I think he was really going for a way to, you know, opt out of the current system and just have a way that people can just be uh, yeah, self-sufficient. I love it. And he accidentally maybe just fixed money by that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, because I mean, it, it, Bitcoin impacts a lot of things and, you know, he just stepped away. So I was like, you know, to not still have any influence after, you know, leaving it kind of, kind of so early. It's like, it's, you know, I'm thankful that he stepped away because it kind of gives Bitcoin a lot of the, you know, value and you know, a very compelling interest because it's like, oh, there's this person that just built this and then stepped away and, you know, had the kind of courage and determination to still do that. I think that's, that's really powerful. Absolutely. Uh, really cool. Um, before I let you go, where can people uh, message you, ask you questions uh, or ask questions about Jules? Yeah, they can, um, as of right now, um, we we'll, might be changing our domain soon, but um, as of right now, you can go to uh, joltsrewards.com. Um, J O L T Z rewards.com. Um, hopefully getting the jolts.com domain, uh, here soon. We're trying to get it from the domain registrar. There's some issues going on with it. Um, or they can find us on uh, Twitter or X, um, at jolts underscore BTC. Um, we, uh, are on LinkedIn, you know, all the other things. Um, but they can contact me as well. My email is just Steven, um, S T E P H E N at jolts rewards.com. Um, if they ever want to reach out. Perfect. Then. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being here. Also for everyone watching and listening. Uh, as always, thank you for uh, joining us. And I'll be here tomorrow again with another episode. Bye-bye.